Part One, Chapter Three of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter Three: The Spiritual Life. Though the outward man may perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. St. Paul The failure of her life plan left Florence in a great state of dejection. The day of personal hopes and fears, she wrote, is over for me. Now I dread and desire no more. This was but a passing mood, and very soon, as we shall hear in the next chapter, she resumed, with increased determination, her struggle for freedom and self-expression in a life of action. But for the moment, and at many recurring moments in later years, the dejection was intense. It was not merely the disappointment of an eager mind denied its appropriate energy. It was the exceeding bitter cry of an intensely religious soul, tempted in its perplexity to ask, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In some autobiographical notes, Miss Nightingale recorded under the year 1843 an illness and an acquaintance I made with a woman to whom all unseen things seemed real, and eternal things near, awakened me from dreaming. The woman to whom she referred was, it may safely be conjectured, Miss Hannah Nicholson, they met once or twice a year, when Miss Nicholson visited Embley, or Miss Nightingale stayed with Miss Nicholson's brother at Waverley. At other times they exchanged a voluminous correspondence, and this was almost entirely devoted to religious experiences and speculations. Aunt Hannah had inexhaustible sympathy with her self-torturing young friend. She did not chide or discourage Florence, but the burden of her message was the claim of the spiritual life, the message of Paul to the Corinthians. Your whole life, wrote Florence, in one of the many bursts of affectionate gratitude to Miss Nicholson, seems to be love, and you always find words in your heart which, without the pretension of enlightening, yet are like a clearing up to me. You always seem to rest on the heart of the divine teacher and to participate in his mysteries. Your letters, she said on another occasion, stay by me and warm me when the dreams of life come one after another, clouding and covering the realities of the unseen. To this sympathetic, and in some limited respects, kindred soul, Florence poured out unreservedly the experiences of her spiritual life, and also, sometimes, though with more conscious art of literary expression, to Miss Clark in Paris. 2. A few letters selected from a great number will serve to trace the course of her religious thoughts. They resumed, it will be seen, the spiritual experiences and convictions of the saints who have served mankind. The Reality of the Unseen World is the subject of a letter to Miss Clark, August 1846, in which, after a page of family news, she continues. But I think you must be tired of all this, for I fancy that you live much more in the supernatural than in the natural world. I always believe in Homer, and in St. Paul's Cloud of Witnesses, and in the old Italian pictures, which have a first story, where the unseen live all premier with a two-pair back, where the pair eternal's shadow is half seen peeping out, and a ground floor where poor mortals live, but still have a connection with the establishment above stairs. I like those books, where the invisible communicates freely with the visible kingdom, not that they ever come up to one's idea, which is always so much brighter than the execution, for the word is only the shadow cast by the light of the thought, but they are suggestive. I always believe in a multitude of spirits inhabiting the same house with ourselves. We are only the entresol, quite the most insignificant of its lodgers, and too busy with our pursuit of daily bread, too much confined with hard work, and too full of struggle with the material world, to visit the glorious beings immediately about us. Whom we shall see, when the present candle of our earthly reason is put out, which blinds us just as the candle end, left burning after one is in bed, long prevents us from seeing the world without, lit up by the full moon. It trembles and flickers and sinks into its socket, and then we catch a bright stripe of moonlight shining on the floor. 
but it flares up again, and the silvery stream is gone, as if it could not be, as if it had not been, and we see nothing but the candle, and hardly imagine any other light, till at last it goes quite out, and the flood of moonlight rushes into the room, and every pane of the casement window, and every ivy leaf without, are stamped, as it were, upon the floor, and a whole world revealed to us, which that flickering candle was the means of concealing from us. This is what Jesus Christ meant, I suppose, when he said that he must go away in order to be with his friends in his spirit, that he would be much nearer to them after death than in the flesh. In the flesh we were separated from our friends by their going into the next room only. A door, a partition divided us. But what can separate two souls? Often I fancy that we can perceive the presence of a good spirit communicating thoughts to us. Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister unto us? When Jesus Christ warns us not to despise any one, because that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of his Father, perhaps he thought that our beloved ones, who are gone, might be these our angels, who must therefore have communion with men. It is here where a cold and false life of conventionalism and prejudices and frivolity is often all that reaches our outward senses, that we are sometimes baffled in seeing into the life which lies beneath. It is here, amidst the tempers and little vexations, which are the shadows that dim the brightest intercourse, it is here that we fail sometimes in having intimate communion with souls, and we stop short at the dead coverings. But between the souls, which is free, and our soul, what barrier, what restraint can there be? Human sympathy is indeed necessary to our happiness of every moment, and the absence of it makes an awful void in our life. Every room becomes a grave, and every book we used to read together a monument to the one we love. But some one says that we need an idée marvelle to preserve us from the busy devils, which imagination here is always conjuring up. This idée marvelle, I think, is the idea of the loving presence of spirits. Those dear ones are safe, and yet with us still, for truly do I believe that these senses of ours are what veil from us not discovered to us, the world around, which is sometimes revealed to us in dreams, or in moments of excitement, as at the point of death, either our own or a friend's, or by mesmerism, or by faith. Faith is the real eye and ear of the soul, and as it would be impossible to describe the harmony and melody of music to one who is born deaf, or to make a blind man perceive the beauty of the effects of color, so without faith the spiritual world is as much a hidden one to the soul as the art of painting to the blind man. On a dark night the moon, when at last she rises, reveals to us, just at our feet, a world of objects, of the presence of which we were not aware before. We see the river sparkling in the moonbeams close beside us, and the tall shadows sleeping quietly on the grass, and the sharp relief of the architectural cornices, and the strong outline of the lights and shades, so well defined that we can scarcely believe that a moment ago, and we did not see them. What shall we say if, one day, the moon rises upon our spiritual world, and we see close at hand, ready to hold the most intimate communion with us, those spirits with whom we had loved and mourned, as lost to us? We are like the blind man by the wayside, and ought to sit and cry, Lord, that we may receive our sight. And when we do receive it, we shall perhaps find that we require no transporting into another world to become aware of the immediate presence of an infinite spirit and of other lesser ones whom we thought gone. What we require is sight, not change of place, I believe. The struggle which absorbed Florence's mind and heart was to establish some harmony between her dealings in the world of sense and her communion with the unseen world. She reproached herself for impatience, for selfishness, for lack of confidence in the good time of God. Happy are they who have no more occasion than she to deem themselves unprofitable servants. But the condition of attainment to comparative sinlessness is, I suppose, the conviction of sin, and this was intensely present to Florence Nightingale. I have read over your letters many times again and again since I have been here, she wrote from Tapton, her grandmother's shore house, in 1845. Ah, uh, my dear Aunt Hannah, you are like the white swan on your cool, fresh, blue lake, rocked to peace and rest by the sweet winds of your faith and love, 
and you cannot be dragged down into our busy chicken-yard of struggling, scratting life. You do not know what it is when one has sinned with such aggravation as I have. No one has had such advantages, and I have sinned with all these, and after having been made to know what sin was and what my obligations were. No one has so grieved the Holy Spirit. I have sinned against my conviction, and, as it were, standing before God's judgment seat. In many of Miss Nightingale's religious outpourings, both in letters and in private diaries, there is a note which borders on the morbid. But the danger point is averted, sometimes by practical good sense, and sometimes by a saving sense of humor. The letter, just given, was soon followed by another, from Embley, October 1845, containing this account of a scene at the bedside of her favorite little cousin. One night, when I was reading to Shore the verse about the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we were agreeing that the temptations of the flesh were like a great deal of play and no work, and lying long bed, and the temptations of the world liking to be praised and admired, and to be a general favorite, and so on, more than anything else, and we were both very much affected, he said before I left him, Now I may lie in bed tomorrow, and you won't call me at six, will you? And I, too, went away to dream about a great many things which I had much better not think about. Oh, how I did laugh at the results of all our feelings! To think and to be are two such different things. To bring thought and action into harmony, to make the presence of the unseen a guide through the path of this present world, that is the problem of the practically religious life. To Florence Nightingale, communion with the unseen meant something deeper, richer, fuller, more positive than the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning, but not the end, of wisdom, for perfect love casteth out fear. It was for the love of God as an active principle in her mind, constraining all her deeds, that she strove. When she was conscious of falling away from this grace, she knew the pains of hell, here and now, as the state of a soul in estrangement from the eternal goodness. To Miss Nicholson, Embley, Christmas Eve, undated. Think of me tomorrow at the sacrament. I have not taken it since I last took it with you, except once with a poor woman on her deathbed. Time has sped wearily with me since then, Aunt Hannah. If, when the plough goes over the soul, there were always the hand of the sower there to scatter the seed after it, who would regret? But how often the seed time has passed. It is too late. The harrow has gone over. The time of harvest has come, and the harvest is not. Give me your thoughts tomorrow, my dear Aunt Hannah. I want them sadly, and take me with you to the throne of grace. Bless me, too, as poor Esau said. I have so felt with him, and cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he never has yet, and I have not deserved that he should. To Miss Nicholson, May 1846 The sorrows of hell compassed me about. We learn to know that these are beforehand when we cannot command our thoughts to pray, when all our omissions give themselves form and life, and shut us up within a wall over which there is no looking, no return. When they hold us down with a resistless power, and we are hemmed in with our remembrances, like a cell compassing us about, what can the future hell be other than this? The unspeakable presence may be joy and peace unspeakable, but it may be a horror, a dweller on our threshold, a spirit of fear to the stricken conscience. Jesus Christ prayed on the cross not for life or safety, but only for the light of his countenance. Why hast thou forsaken me? And all sorrows disappear before that one. Let those who have felt it say if it is not so, and if there is any sorrow like unto that sorrow. How willingly would we exchange it for pain, which we almost welcome as proof of his care and attention, Grief in itself is no evil, and making the unseen, the eternal, and the infinite present to our consciousness is rather a good. But when all one's imaginations are wandering out of one's reach, then one realizes the future state of punishment even in this world. Pray that he will not leave my soul in hell. How little can be done under the spirit of fear. It is the very sentence pronounced upon the serpent. Upon thy belly shalt thou go all the days of thy life. Oh, if any one thinks that, in the repentance of fear, this is the time for the soul to open to the infinite goodness, 
to the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind in the heart's death to live and love let him try how hard it is to collect oneself out of distraction let him feel the woes of saying tomorrow when god has said today and then when he has found how weary stale flat and unprofitable seem all the uses of the world let him try with a dead heart to live unto god to love with all his strength when all energy to love is gone the state of perfect love expressing itself in perfect rightness of thought and deed may be unattainable on earth but nothing lower than the search for this ideal can satisfy the yearnings of a soul such as was florence nightingale's she had the hunger for righteousness the crown of righteousness she wrote to miss nicholson may eighteen forty six that word always strikes me more than anything in the bible strange that not happiness not rest not forgiveness not glory should have been the thought of that glorious man's mind when at the eve of the last and greatest of his labors all desires so swallowed up in the one great craving after righteousness that at the end of all his struggles it was mightier within him than ever mightier even than the desire for peace how can people tell one to dwell within a good conscience when the chief of all the apostles so panted after righteousness that he considered it the last best gift unattainable on earth to be bestowed in heaven to do all for the love of god was the ideal which she sought to attain the foundations of all must be the love of god that the sufferings of christ's life were intense who doubts but the happiness must also have been intense only think of the happiness of working and working successfully too with no doubts as to his path and with no alloy of vanity or love of display or glory but with the ecstasy of single-heartedness all that i do is always poisoned by the fear that i am not doing it in simplicity and godly sincerity this was one of the constant dreads throughout her life when she had become famous and was praised and courted by the popular breath she shrank with an abhorrence which some may have considered almost morbid and which was certainly foreign to the fashion of the world from any avoidable publicity this was no pose or affectation it was part of her religion it was a counsel dictated by her earnest striving to disassociate her work for god from any taint of worldliness three the world which came to owe much to the life and example of florence nightingale owes something to miss nicholson whose gentle sympathy brought to her young friend much strength and peace but the world may also be glad i think that miss nightingale's religious thought worked itself out in the end on lines of her own florence nightingale has been enrolled by the popular voice among the saints but there are saints and saints saints contemplative or mystic and saints active and ministering in all ages of the world there have been godly women whose passion of religious spirit has led them to lives of professional pieties rather than of practical service who have spent in ecstasies of pity or in tortures of self-abasement at the foot of the cross powers which might have gone to redeem and save the world florence nightingale had as we have sufficiently seen a profound sense of personal religion she felt as all the saints must feel that a religious life means a state of soul but she attained also to the conviction which became ever stronger within her that a state of soul can only be approved by its fruits and that thus the service of god is the service of man to miss nicholson embley september fourth eighteen forty six i am almost heartbroken to leave lee hurst there are so many duties there which lie near at hand and i could be well content to do them there all the days of my life i have left so many poor friends there whom i shall never see again and so much might have been done for them i feel my sympathies are with ignorance and poverty the things which interest me interest them we are alike in expecting little from life much from god we are taken up with the same objects my imagination is so filled with the misery of this world that the only thing in which to labor brings any return seems to me helping and sympathizing there and all that poets sing of the glories of this world appears to me untrue all the people i see are eaten up with care or poverty or disease i know that it was god who created the good and man the evil which was not the will of god but the necessary consequence of his leaving free will to man i know that misery is the alphabet of fire in which history 
with its warning hand writes in flaming letters the consequences of evil the kingdom of man and that without its glaring light we should never see the path back into the kingdom of god or heed the directing guideposts but the judgments of nature the law of god as she goes her mighty solemn inflexible march sweeps sometimes so fearfully over man that though it is the triumph not the defeat of god's truth and of his laws that falsehood against them must work misery and misery is perhaps here the strongest proof that his loving hand is present yet all our powers hopes and fears must it seems to me be engrossed by doing his work for its relief life is no holiday game nor is it a clever book nor is it a school of instruction nor a valley of tears but it is a hard fight a struggle a wrestling with the principle of evil hand to hand foot to foot every inch of the way must be disputed the night is given us to take breath to pray to drink deep at the fountain of power the day to use the strength which has been given us to go forth to work with it till the evening the kingdom of god is coming and thy kingdom come does not mean only my salvation come to find out what we can do she wrote as an annotation in browning's periclesis one's individual place as well as the general end is man's task to serve man for god's sake not man's will prevent failure from being disappointment florence nightingale sought then to save her soul by serving others it was by this same test of practical service that she came to try and to weigh the various forms of religious doctrine her father was as i have said a unitarian and several other members of her family circle were of the same persuasion but she and some others of that circle conformed in practice to the services of the english church and so in some degree miss nightingale continued to conform to the end of her life though as we shall find later she departed widely from the doctrines of the church as ordinarily received did not care about going to church and framed a creed of her own but she always had a tolerant mind for any faith that issued in good works and an impatience with any that did not it is for this reason that she seemed to be all things to all men in religious matters her mission to the crimea involved as we shall learn some religious bickerings protestants thought her too indulgent to roman catholics and catholics were sore that she did not go further with them but her real attitude is perfectly clear and was entirely consistent if she looked with a favoring eye on roman catholics it was on account not of their dogmas but of their deeds two letters to madame mole ten years apart in date suggest what was always miss nightingale's point of view lee hurst september eighteen forty one we are very anxious to hear dearest miss clark how you are going on and how mrs clark is some day when you are able to write we are just returning from the leeds consecration and a more curious and interesting sight i never saw imagine a procession of four hundred clergymen all in their white robes with scarves of blue and black and fur and even scarlet so that i thought some of them were cardinals headed up by the archbishop of york the bishop of ripon etc and most curious of all the bishop of new jersey to whom dr hook who is you know perhaps the puseyite vicar of leeds had written to ask him to come over from america expressly to preach the consecration sermon imagine all this procession entering the church repeating the twenty-fourth psalm and then filling the space before the altar and the transept and all responding aloud through the service so that the roll and echo of their responses through the transept without being able to see them was the most striking thing i ever heard it was quite a gathering place for the puseites from all parts of england papa heard them debating whether they should have lighted candles before the altar but they decided no because the bishop of ripon would not like it however they had them in the evening and the next morning when he was gone and dr hook had the regular catholic jerk in making the genuflection every time he approaches the altar the church is a most magnificent one and every one has contributed their best to it with a true catholic spirit one gave the beautiful painted window another the corregio for the altarpiece the queen dowager the altar cloth another the bells etc etc dr hook gives a service every morning and evening at half past seven and the sacrament every sunday and the aisle is all occupied by open seats during the consecration i wish to have been a clergyman but when mrs gaskell whom i was with she is a good tory 
and half a Puzite, and withal the most general favorite and generally lenient person in England. When she and I came down afterwards for the sacrament, I could not help looking in the faces of the clergymen for the impression I expected to see as they walked down the aisle and wandered about, this immense crowd, after the sacrament, and oh, I was woefully disappointed. They looked so stupid, and I could not help thinking, if you had been Catholics, you would all have been on your knees during the service without minding your fine gowns and the cold stones. Embley, February 7th, 1851 I suppose you know how the two churches have been convulsing themselves in England in a manner discreditable to themselves and ridiculous to others. The Anglican Church screamed and struggled as if they were taking away something of hers. The Catholic Church sang and shouted as if she had conquered England. Neither the one nor the other has happened. Only a good many people, in our church, found out they were Catholics and went to Rome, and a good many other people found out they were Protestants, which they never knew before, and left the Puzite pen, which has now lost half its sheep. At Oxford, the Puzite volcano is extinct. You know what a row there will be this session in Parliament about it. The most moderate wish for a concordant, but even these say that we must strip the Roman Catholic bishops of the new titles. Many think the present government will go out upon it, because they won't do enough to satisfy the awakened prejudices of dear John Bull. I used to think it was a mere selfish quarrel between red stockings and lawn sleeves, but not a bit of it. It's a real popular feeling." One would think that all our religion was political by the way we talk, and so I believe it is. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, you hear our clergy talking of nothing but bishops versus vicars general. Never a word of different plans of education, prisons, penitentiaries, and so on. One would think we were born ready-made as to education, but that art made a church. I feel little zeal in pulling down one church or building up another, in making bishops or unmaking them, if they would but make us. Our faith would spring up of itself, and then we shouldn't want either Anglican Church or Roman Catholic Church to make it for us. But, bless my soul, people are just as ignorant now of any law in the human mind as they were in Socrates' time. We have learned the physical laws since then, but mental laws. Why, people don't even acknowledge their existence. They talk of grace and divine influence. Why, if it's an arbitrary gift from God, how unkind of him not to give it before, and if it comes by certain laws, why don't we find them out? But people in England think it quite profane to talk of finding them out, and they pray, that it may please thee to have mercy upon all men, when I should knock you down if you were to say to me, that it should please you to have mercy upon your boy. I never had any training, and training to be called training, as we train the fingers to play scales and shakes, I doubt whether anybody ever gets from other people, because they don't know how to give it according to any certain laws. I wish everybody would write, as far as they can, a short account of God's dealings with them, like the old Puritans, and then perhaps we should find out at last what are God's ways in his goings-on and what are not. Arthur Stanley, afterwards the dean, once asked her to use her influence in preventing a friend of his and of hers from taking the step supposed to be imminent, of joining the Roman Communion. In a long reply which Miss Nightingale wrote with great care, November 26, 1852, she promised to do what she could, but explained that this might not be much. She herself remained in the Anglican Communion because she was born there, and because the Roman Church offered some things which she personally did not want. She feared that their friend might consider that such arguments, as she could urge against the Roman Church, applied equally against the Anglican and, on the other hand, she had never concealed her opinion that the Roman communion offered advantages to women which the Church of England, at that time, did not. The Catholic orders, she wrote, offered me work, training for that work, sympathy and help in it, such as I had in vain sought in the Church of England. The Church of England has for men bishoprics, archbishoprics, and a little work, good men make a great deal for themselves. For women, she has what? I had no taste for theological discoveries. I would have given her my head, my heart, my hand. She would not have them. She did not know what to do with them. She told me to go back and do crochet in my mother's drawing room, or, if I were tired of that, to marry and look well at the head of my husband's table. You may go to the Sunday school if you like it, she said. But she gave me no training even for that. 
She gave me neither work to do for her nor education for it. The latter part of the second letter to Miss Clark shows Miss Nightingale's interest in speculations about the basis of moral law, but so far as the rivalry of churches was concerned, it was by works that she tried them. In all the dens of disgrace and disease, she wrote in one of her notebooks, the only clergy who deserve the name of pastors are the Roman Catholic. The rest, of all denominations, Church of England, Church of Scotland, dissenters, are only theology or tea mongers. It will never do, she said once to a friend, unless we have a church of which the terms of membership shall be works, not doctrines. She was interested, however, in doctrines also. If she was resolved to dedicate her life to the service of man, she was no less convinced that such service could only be rendered at the best and highest, in the light and with the sanction of service to God. Herein may be found an underlying unity and harmony through the many and diverse interests of her life. We shall see that she who opened new careers and standards of practical benevolence in the modern world spent also years of thought upon the less manageable task, if not of providing the world with a new religion, at any rate of giving to old doctrines a new application and, as she hoped, a more acceptable sanction. End of chapter 3